So today on Learning Unbox, we have a very special treat. Um, PASS Foundation, as you all know, um, has recently celebrated 20 years in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, and as, as so, so like so many of us around the world, our plans um, were derailed. Uh, we were gonna have an epic celebration, <clears throat> trying to figure out what that was gonna be. And then something else comes along. And so it gave us a lot of opportunity at the Past Foundation to think about um, a lot of things, including, you know, what was the next 20 years going to look like for us? And it got the staff collectively um, getting very uh, introspective, I guess you will, um, and asking a ton of questions about sort of the Past Foundation's origin story. And on this program, we're always talking about um, best cases. And we, we, we frequently talk about how things get started and why starting um, matters so much. And so we thought this would be a great opportunity to actually revisit the origin story of the past foundation. And for those of you that might not be overly familiar, um, you know, what, what we, we state on our website is that 20 years ago, two anthropologists, a documentary filmmaker, a graphic designer and historian, along with an international team of research scientists launched the PAST Foundation. Um, and so today, those four individuals um, are the conversation that we're going to have. And I cannot tell you how excited I am to have um, this group together because these are the folks that, um, that launched a grand adventure. Uh, a true journey. And so uh, joining us today um, is um, Shelly Smith. Uh, Shelly uh, uh, is from the Napa, California area, um, a maritime historian, um, a legend in the field of underwater archaeology, um, and um, has um, spent day in and day out for many, many years um, with me living the everyday components of what it takes um, to build an organization like Past Foundation. And she is currently the executive director of the Napa County Historical Society, uh, which is a research center and museum concentrating on bringing history alive through technology, exhibition, and innovative programming. And it's really exciting for Shelley to get back to those museum roots. So Shelley, welcome to the program. Hi, Annalise. Good to hear you. <laughs> and joining Shelly is um, Andy Hall. And Andy Hall is a maritime historian um, um, component uh, of that original uh, group of four of us. Um, and he you know, Andy has actually worn so many hats over the years, it's really hard for me to kind of <laughs> keep up with um, all of that. Um, but I suspect that one of the things that is near and dear to, to Andy these days is that he currently serves on the board of directors of the Texas Navy Association and as chairman of that organization's effort to locate the remains of the Texian schooner Invincible um, that was wrecked in Galveston in 1837. Um, and so again, you're going to see a lot of similarities in, the, in these stories. So Andy, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. We are happy to have you. <clears throat> and rounding out our little um, band of four warriors, so to speak, um, <laughs> is documentary filmmaker um, Dennis Egg. And um, Dennis is uh, currently in Bozeman, Montana. Um, and just like like Andy and Shelley, numerous, numerous accolades in their um, their chosen profession um, over the years. Um, you know, so so Dennis has been involved in everything from natural and documentary film making to crazy adventures to um, trudging along a variety of different places in the early years with with Andy and Shelly and I um, and he is um, also a longtime um, board member of the PASS Foundation he's now a more emeritus board member so um, Dennis um, welcome thanks Annalise I'm happy to be here so so it's been a, a, a journey as we think about all of these uh, different pieces. And, um, you know, when we sort of talk about origin story and what, the importance of origin story, it gets really interesting when you sort of start diving into that. Um, and actually, Shelly, I'm going to toss this first one to you because the staff reminded me, um, you know, that every time we got stuck, you know, Shelly uh, you know, on a project would... Um, would always ask, well, what's the origin of that thing, right? Or what's the origin story? Do we really even understand why, why an organization, a group, a school, a set of teachers, a community partner, you know, why they are where they are, um, you know? So, so as the anthropologist, I'll put that hat on Shelly and help us understand the context for why origin is so important. 
And then we're going to get into the weeds of the crazy cast uh, past wow. staff questions. They just asked me that because they knew I was the provocateur. That's right. <laughs> Always been the case. Um, Always. Case, yeah. Um, I think the why, because if you can answer the why, uh, as um, Steve Jobs once told us, if you can answer the why, uh, what you create is secondary, and, but the why is the real is the real heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can get past the, the why is also gonna show you all the obstacles and all the stumbling blocks. So it gives you kind of a navigational um, kind of cool way to look at the world. Um, we often had teachers who, if we understood the why, we could actually get them to make a change. Um, so I think the why in past was always extremely important to us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely still is. Um, I would agree with that. Yeah. So, um, which I think gets us directly to um, the first question from the staff, which actually starts with why, question mark, why the four of you, <laughs> why this, why then, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, Shelly, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think that that's really important. So just, uh, just for our listeners sort of setting a bit of the stage. Um, so, um, so Dennis and I got together around some of that crazy idea and we'll get into some of the the weeds with that and very quickly very shortly on the heels of that um, started working um, with Shelly and with Andy um, on the first set of projects that will really sort of set the foundational piece um, for past so it was really critically important but you know I guess I'm going to toss this question to each of you Dennis I'm going to start with you um, why why past why this thing I mean of all the things 20 years ago you couldn't have gotten involved with why, why on earth would you get involved with this crazy idea right. I mean, I still remember the first time I met you, you came in, I had this basement office uh, for my production company. And we had just finished this absolutely hellacious project with National Geographic about K2, um, <laughs> where we sent a crew to K2, but the India and Pakistan had declared war on each other and we're fighting over Kashmir, which if you know the geography, right, Andy, yeah. it's, they're all on top of each other, you know? Um, so, so honestly, so this, this young woman comes into my office, you know, and lets me know that she was referred by my uh, sister-in-law, I think, and uh, via her fiance at the time, Chip. And, um, you know, and she outlined past to me in like two sentences, you know, um, and I do remember that I think there's a mention of Red River and sunken boats and this kind of stuff. And I thought, well, that sounds like a nice change from, you know, a big international project and should be very simple, you know? So I said, yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> and then she sat down and we talked for a while and here we are, you know? So that's how I remember it started. And, <laughs> and I mean, the, the idea of past was, was really what hooked me, you know, it was the idea that whether it was these archeologists, it was um, in, in a lot of ways, but some other things I've done since then, both with past and, and with Montana State, you know, where I teach, um, it's like, you know, you understand the present and future by understanding the past, you know? And even though that's not what past means um, <laughs> and, um, you know, that it was going to involve technology and expeditions. And I think the whole thing was that Annalise was so enthusiastic uh, and just had that vision, you know, and I just said, sure, yeah, let's do this, you know, and that's, that's it. You were so, glutton for punishment. You had no idea what yeah. you were signing on for. I, had no, I just want to be really not. clear. Of not. None but of us knew. Not a single one you of know, us really, really knew what we were we were we were doing. I mean, here's the thing. Sidney Pollack has the, had this uh, comment about filmmaking. You know, the decision to make a film is a decision to have a train wreck, and <laughs> and then the second decision to control the train wreck. Okay, so when I'm in a field that thinks like that anyway. You know, past has not been the worst train wreck I've been with. So, oh, and it's not a train wreck at all. Awesome you know? way to qualify there, Dennis. <laughs> uh, right, so. <laughs> Just saying, you know, there have been bumpy, bumpy times, you know. Okay, but, move, uh, moving on from Dennis. Andy, save um, us. <laughs> uh, my, my introduction to past was very similar to Dennis's. Um, you and I first met at Shipwreck Weekend at mm -hmm. Texas A&M. Uh, in College Station, I think in 2000. 
Yeah, that sounds uh, about right. Yeah. And that was, as I recall, that was right about the time past was either first organized or incorporated or mm -hmm. very shortly yep. after. Yep. Um, and then we, so when I thought it was, a, it was a really exciting thing because your focus was, uh, was public education, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. especially with kids and young adults and, and, and young people. And the thing that I've always been interested in is the public education side of stuff. It's wonderful what anthropologists do, what, what, what other scientists and researchers do, but the critical piece is getting that material to a wider audience mm -hmm. and to get those things appreciated by a wider audience. So that's what, that's what excited me about past. Um, we continued that conversation um, later at SHA with Shelley in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, uh, and then we really got going with Red River in 2001. Yeah, absolutely. Shelly, same question to you. Um, I you remember know, the bar conversation. Awesome, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this, that doesn't make the train wreck sound so bad. No, know? but you know, and we, we, we full disclosure, right? Shelly and I, yeah. we say this all the time. You know, the best, best ideas on the planet happen at your professional conference, whatever your profession might happen to be, often at the bar where people are just... Right brainstorming and letting loose on the wild crazy ideas because you feel like I'm unfettered in this environment right I'm allowed to say the crazy thing and it might be okay yeah I remember that we were all talking about we were really challenged at the time in the 90s yeah. to bring um, the passion of archaeology to the forefront um, that most uh, were written and we're still in that paper mode at the time that um, the paper, when it finally got to paper, you know, it would bore your grandmother. Yeah. Um, and so it was just like, oh God, we got to get out of that. We got to break this habit. Look what Indiana Jones literally raised um, enrollment in colleges by 20%. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to figure this out. We've got to figure this out. And I remember we're all sitting there drinking. We turn around, we go, oh, you just got your PhD. You could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I do have often said I, I drew the short straw, literally. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the real problem was that she remembered I was in that conversation and called me later <laughs> and said, you said, I was like, oh, God. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, go it on. was, go on, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that was, uh, it's one of those few times, I mean, in the 40 years i've been at those conferences um and all of the brilliant and wonderful brainstorms i've been privileged to be part of i think that was the one that i think we all thought we could do this we can do it you know and uh, and, and i so i mean kudos to annalise for actually not just throwing us off but actually making me off. cry <laughs> do not do that <laughs> that is good stuff you know, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a team effort and it always has been this team effort because it takes all of these folks thinking really creative and unfettered, right? As, 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 as you guys have said, and, and it, and it takes the other piece to the launching of something like this, I think, is it, it back to Shelly's point, hey, you just finished this thing, this PhD, and oh, by the way, you don't have a job, <laughs> which was true, <laughs> you know? So, hey, we have this idea collectively. How about you go see if you can launch this thing? It'll give you something to do while you're looking for other things, right? You know, and, but I, but there's, there's an, a really important truth in that because you have to have the time, not just the idea and the support structure around you to be able to do a thing, but you have to have the, the freedom and the latitude to also then be able to do that. Um, Andy, you wanted to add something. What was that? No, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to say to Shelley's point about, about being caught in a paper world mm. uh, where you're mostly communicating with your, with, with your fellow professionals. Um, a, a colleague of mine around that same time uh, said, oh, I just got a paper published in prestigious uh, archaeology journal. Uh, and I said, really, how do, how was it, how was it received? And he said, both people who read it really enjoyed it, <laughs> you know? So, so that's, that gets to the, the idea of, of wanting to go mm -hmm. to a much larger, much wider public audience. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And it's the same, I think, across all the applied research sciences, um, a variety of descriptions, right? However you want to pull whatever labels you want to put on those. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, but the you know, we, we very quickly, we started with what we, we knew, right, which is, was archaeology, and, and back to, to um, you know, the point of being made, look what Indiana Jones, is, as Shelley said, because um, it was all around that spark, that spark for others, or it had really nothing to do, you know, with us and our own love for the field that we have, uh, you know, obviously that was a contributing factor, but at the end of the day, back to what Andy was saying, that public outreach and engagement component, right, was about, can we spark others, no matter what the topic is, and ultimately we, we very quickly branch out from, from archaeology into tons of other things, but we came to all of those other things with that same sort of drive and desire. Can I make this thing? Can I make this chemistry experiment or this archaeology experiment or, you know, this physics problem so exciting and so intriguing to others that they will latch on? And, and I think that was a challenge for us, right? I mean, I think that the other thing we haven't really talked about here, which gets me to my next staff question, which was around, hey, who are the naysayers? I mean, I think part of it was, you know, hey, can we actually do that? Can we pull this off? Well, yeah, I remember Scrunch. I mean, what did we know about that other than, you know, we were scuba divers. I, I think that we brought that archaeology and, uh, you know, I, I was going to say that when we wanted to reach beyond paper, it was Andy and Dennis who brought mm -hmm. the tools to the game that I certainly didn't possess. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still in awe of Andy's talent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Dennis's talent. I mean, we just like we brought stuff to the to the game that nobody had ever seen before and uh, so it makes a really cool thing and then we were just fearless i mean mm -hmm. let's put a bunch of you know coke cans at 4000 feet and see what happens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> hence the name scrunch for those of you right. that are listening you can go <laughs> yeah. to the past website and find that that early uh sets of modules so um yeah, we, we were fearless, but it, it wasn't easy along the way. And so, um, like I said, you know, one of the other questions the staff has is, you know, was there, and it doesn't have to be an individual, but, you know, what were all the, the sort of the naysay or the negatives, you know, around not doing this thing? And ultimately, how do you then balance that or counterbalance that with the, the primary motivator that actually got us to launch? And this was an interesting one when the staff asked me to, to ask this question, because I had to step back and think about it. And don't get me wrong. You know, I know it was, it's been a journey, as, as Dennis Boyd said. It was a journey all along the way. But, you know, maybe you just forget the, the naysayers along the way. I, I don't know. I'm curious, um, you know, from the three of you, do you, do you remember? I mean, I think. Yeah, no, I yes. I mean, <laughs> like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, well, here, here's what I think was the strength. I never remember any of the four of us ever saying, let's not do it, or, or we can't do it. It's mm -hmm. just that we dealt with each problem and solved it the best we could. And, you know, coming out of filmmaking, that's really, you know, the attitude you have to have, or you never get anything done. And mm -hmm. I think it's true of a lot of things. So, so yeah, we had, you know, remember, you know, Red River had a lot of politics. We had a lot of bureaucracy things. We had <laughs> definitely money issues, you know, I mean, they're normal, you know, if you look at that era as past as a kind of not-for-profit startup, you know, mm -hmm. those are things every entrepreneur has to deal with, you know, and Annalise, as our leader, you know, never really faltered. And I do not ever remember any of us talking about not doing something or stopping it or whatever. And I think that's really what got us through it. You know, I think it, it was because I was so naive. I had no idea what I was in way over my well, head or some, when to say no. And I fully fess up to that. I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> but that's that's sometimes what you need. You know, you just don't know that. No, you can't do it. So you actually do it. You know, it's the old, you know, it's the it's the, you know, NASA thing. Failure is mm -hmm. not an option, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't think we ever said that, but we acted that way. It's just like, no, here are the issues. How are we going to deal with them? Let's do it. And, and that, as far as even, even when past was more established and we had other kinds of issues uh, when I was on the board, uh, that has always been past attitude. Mm -hmm. And I think 
that's one of its strengths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Does that I, sound I, right? I yeah. would agree with that. And <laughs> I don't know, Andy, it right? you know, so, Andy, did so. you notice that he compared our journey and our success to NASA? I'd like to point <laughs> out NASA just managed to land on Mars again. So, I, you know, that's some pretty darn good company. And well, as I well, said, well, they well, could this? land on Mars, but they couldn't keep the power on in Texas. You know, I mean, not NASA, <laughs> NASA. As well, a country, we go to Mars, you know, but we can't, we can't get the power in Texas. So, you know, NASA has been doing their thing for longer than past has. So check back with past in 40 years and we'll see where we are. There. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I would just say I didn't, I, I was a little bit removed um, mm -hmm. and didn't have, didn't have to deal with the naysayers mm -hmm. uh, as much as, as much as you did on Lise or Shelly, but, or, or Dennis, but, but, um, but, but, I agree with Dennis um, in that I think I think a lot of past success and the reason there still is a past um, is largely because Annalise was very, very good at presenting the idea and convincing folks that who who might otherwise have been naysayers um, that it was doable um, because it was it was really innovative and unusual and in and it seems to me everybody got caught up in that enthusiasm. Mm. It was infectious. And that, that, was, that was a key to the early success. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we ignored a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I mean, you know, I, I, just a statement came to mind as you all were talking about that. Well, I understand the ballet, but I'm really not sure what you do. And uh, <laughs> I remember Annalise kind of coming off her seat, like levitating. And... I think your hands were kind of stretching to the woman's neck. And I, <laughs> I think that we, I, you know, it was, um, I, I didn't understand the moment for years, but much later I, uh, I was in the presence of a, another, uh, an, a really famous underwater archeologist named uh, Pilar Luna. And I asked her like, were you harassed? Did you, did you undergo discrimination, you know, when you were trying to set up uh, underwater archaeology in Mexico. And she looked at me, and she goes, duh, she goes, but I ignored it. And I thought, ah, that's what we were doing. We were just ignoring things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I think that's a, that's a really good point, Shelley, because, and, and, I, and I was laughing when Andy was talking, in part, because, you know, part of it is you, you can go and tell a great story and the reality of it is you have to utterly believe it but that doesn't mean that it's easy to convince others so on the one hand the excitement and the enthusiasm but then when it really came down to you know to to what Shelley was talking about funding and sustainability the the figuring out how to go from the excitement and the and the enthusiasm of the idea, and even quite frankly, the application when it came to, you know, because everything was so field-based driven, hands-on, let's get people out actually living and trying whatever it is, this thing that we're talking about is, but that's, that's not the same as, you know, being able to actually run and sustain and develop and grow an organization. That's, that's a whole nother ball of wax. And, you know, from my own, you know, perspective and point of view, it was nothing that I was ever trained in or even contemplated, right, doing. And so um, I, I think, Shelly, you're right. I mean, I think you, you ignore a lot of things because you have no idea what to pay attention to some days, right? <laughs> And I think as we shifted into STEM and more and more complex applied sciences, not that our own fields are not um, complex in, in many, many ways, but because we are anthropologists or archeologists or filmmakers or web developers or maritime historians or take your pick, the other folks that joined the original board and sort of helped us in those early years, um, you know, when it came time to say, hey, but we can take the exact same way we build these programs and apply it, you know, to, you know, chemical reactions or material science or coding and computer science or take your pick the things over the years that we engaged in. That's a harder sell because, you know, 
the conversation Shelly was referencing, which did in fact happen, that is a true story. And I did come off my seat and Shelly kept me from having to go to jail, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but the reality of it is we encountered that numerous times in that early journey. And to some extent, from time to time, we still encounter it, but not the same way. It's like, okay, what is it that you bring to this table that's different than other things, right? Um, and I always thought that that was our unique value proposition is that we are not the same group of thinkers that are typically sitting around this table. Very true. I thought, I think we also like Dennis would say we're missing this or Andy would say we're missing this. I mean, I remember the, the huge conversation about Red River, Andy, mm -hmm. when you were like, well, how do people understand that this boat is, is you know, nine buses long or something like that? And, and then you went out and drew the thing and, and everybody went, oh yeah, that's exactly what that is. And, and I think that because we came at it from different perspectives and we really could bring our own thinking to the table, we could apply it in so many different ways. It was just quite wonderful to me to be part of that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that in many ways, that's the, that's the part that's the, the most um, enduring, right? You know, the, there's the day to day and there's the, and there's those big, those, those moments of, of excitement. I got a phrase for that Shelly over the years, right? Something I, about boredom and moments of something. Oh yeah. So I always described my job as um, uh, hours of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror. <laughs> And that is not a reflection on past. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> but it, it, it works in whatever job I've had, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So one of the other questions, there's no question about that. One of the other <laughs> questions, though, that um, some of the staff um, had, they really would love us to have a conversation about our individual aha moments. You know, something in those first few years that was so profound to you as an individual that it made it worthwhile and exciting and compelling to be part of this journey. And, you know, beyond just the excitement of startup, you know, we, we had a number of really exciting projects. Those first five years were really, really foundational in more ways than one, right? Because we, we, we actually did a variety of things and we all, I, I just want to make sure that our, our, our listeners and viewers understand we did all of these, those first five years, we all had day jobs. We, we had other jobs. This was a, you know, a part-time organization. It had no funds for operating, quite frankly, really paying people. <laughs> uh, you know, none of those luxuries existed in the early years. Um, and as a result of that, you sort of had to come to it, um, with, with some passion. And, you know, we, we went to Yellowstone, we did Red River, we were in the Outer Banks, we were in the Gulf of Mexico with the U-166. Um, you know, we were in California. And I mean, just some really cool things. So Andy, I'm gonna hit you up first. Uh, was there one, was there an aha or, or uh, something that we did that to you was incredibly meaningful? And of course, everybody's getting the same question and it's just on the hot seat first. <laughs> um, there were multiple aha moments for me. Mm -hmm. um, one of them, um, you just mentioned U-166. Um, one of those was in going through the, uh, in doing the web stuff for that, mm -hmm. um, in going through some of the historical records that had been recovered and preserved uh, and are now in a private collection and are now archived, mm -hmm. um, was going through and looking at the crew members and sort of developing profiles because that mm -hmm. made them, uh, you had Kuhlman who was, the, who was the commander, you had all the other officers. Going through that really sort of humanized that and, mm -hmm. and made it a, a, an important story. And then going through the accounts from the Robert E. Lee and the, which is the ship that the U-166 sank and, and, the, um, uh, and the patrol craft um, that ended up sinking 
U166, but was never given credit for it. Mm -hmm. um, getting into the depth of that story and the personal experiences we were able to reconstruct and present, um, that, that, was a, that, was an important, that was an important moment for me. It wasn't a single moment, but it was, mm -hmm. it was, an, important, it was an important process for me. Yeah, and a fun, fun piece of the story because boy, did we learn an awful lot on that project. <laughs> Oof. Yes, indeed. Heard stories. Yeah, yeah. What about for you, Dennis? I, I mean, like Andy, I had a lot of them. I mean, first of all, I really had to learn how archaeologists work, you know, and what they do <laughs> and what the field is, you know. Um, so, you know, I had. Um, Part of my doctoral training was in folklore because I was doing films in an English department and they didn't know where to put me. So I got in, which was, which was great. And there's some similarities, but you know, th there's a lot of differences too. And so, so I wasn't totally unfamiliar, but you know, um, you know, starting with Red River and you know, how you actually do this kind of expedition and along with all the other things like, you know, meeting people who eat squirrels and that kind of stuff, you know, that was, you know, that was, it was part of my education, you know, I said, okay, and not seeing a green vegetable between like Oklahoma City and, and the river. But um, the, the thing is, you know, along with that, and then I had the other um, thing, which, which was really to me a very interesting challenge is how are we gonna film this? Mm -hmm. And we never had the same conditions twice. So the Red River was not like Yellowstone and it was definitely not like the U-166, you know, mm -hmm. and the U-166 really, you know, really has to stand out. If you have the first five years, you know, that is, you know, one of the high points um, because it was uh, very original research. We were working with the two archaeologists who actually, you know, Rob and Dan, who figured out where the boat was. People have been looking for it for decades, you know, um, and I actually got to go out twice, right? The first mm -hmm. time where we had that interesting conversation when you were pregnant with Jack and they wouldn't let you on the boat <laughs> because of insurance. <laughs> and I, the first time I ever used ship to ship phone, you know, <laughs> so uh, that's still one of my memories seeing mm -hmm. on the lease, like far away. Um, and then, um, and then just documenting it, you know, this mm -hmm. 24 of uh, the second year um, when they were, they were doing uh, the multiple ships and the UN66 uh, where, you know, we just got into it. I was with, you know, uh, two, two of, I guess, three of my students. Lance was almost graduated, but um, mm -hmm. so two of my students and, you know, we had to figure out what to do. You're on a ship. You don't realize how noisy ships are. You know, you don't realize uh, all this stuff. And uh, it was just, you know, I can still remember the first time seeing the U-166 when the camera's on the bottom and it mm -hmm. goes and there's the conning tower. And yep, that's, that's what it is. So, you know, it's a little bit what Andy was saying. You know, we really, along with what we did on the boat, documenting it and what we all were doing with research and learning about the crew, you really got into the lives of, mm -hmm. um, of the U-boat. Mm -hmm. And and the ships that they sank as well, you know. So um, that really, uh, I think, highlighted for me the importance of what past was trying to do on a broader basis, and what you know where it, and where it went eventually in the future. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely, Shelley. Wow, mm -hmm. I don't know what to say. It's just so many. Although I think what kind of percolates to the top for me, and it's not really condensed into the first five years, but, um, you know, I, I was trained to be a four field anthropologist. And by the time I kind of got to past, I'd been a museum director and I'd been an archeologist and I taught genetics, but I, I really didn't ever, I knew that I wasn't really a four field anthropologist. I didn't, hadn't really perceived myself going out in cultural anthropology and linguistics and all that. And as past developed, it made me uh, it made me a four field anthropologist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that was really, really cool. Cause that was, then I was pulling on all the strings of my education and my passion and everything to do everything. And, and so, yeah, those were, those were great moments. And then I think just the kids, the kids made mm -hmm. it the aha, you know, um, I, I, there are a lot of kids that uh, still write me mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And I just, that, is just was like, wow, we impacted another generation. 
that's too cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can can definitely um, echo that that sentiment. Um, People ask me all the time, what do I do? I I will tell them that I'm an anthropologist. And prior to, you know, us really digging into here, I would have said I'm an archaeologist. And it, it seems like a small distinction, but it's an important one. And it's not that one is better um, than the other, not by any stretch of the imagination. But to Shelley's point, this organization allowed me to hone and develop skills that I had just barely touched on. Um, and I think just from a professional sort of growth standpoint to, to sort of feel like you're capable of being able to do more than that, right? Um, and like all of you, there were so many amazing moments um, along the way, um, you know, certainly the, the pieces with the, you know, the, the U-166, you know, Dennis made reference to not letting me on a boat. I would like to point out, I ultimately did get on the boat, right? And that is thanks to a man by the name of Thomas Chance, who at the time, I think it was C- President CEO of CNC Technologies, which does, is not an, even a company that exists anymore, he's retired, um, was like, darn it, you can't leave Annalise on shore, you know? And it was one of those sorts of things that, you know, and Louis Louisiana. And so out goes another boat and, you know, they hired a medic to follow me around the ship for three <laughs> days. If I was out of my cab and that man was standing next to me, um, you know, so crazy things like that to, um, you know, the adventures that Dennis and I and, and his students in Yellowstone Park and the snow, you know, taking the, what well, ultimately Shelly and I would later discover, you know, the sort of STEM schools um, that came around m- much, much later in time, um, you know, into uh, to Yellowstone to do that work and to really um, see kiddos be not just, you know, citizen scientists, if you will, but truly the scientific team. That was my team, right? It, it wasn't all these other professionals. And that was a really important moment for me um, because it showed me that if we, if we provide room um, and have a little bit of faith that the kids kids can do anything if we just give them a little nudge, right? And I think we all intuitively know that, but until you sort of experience it on that sort of level, and then how could we possibly translate that into something bigger, you know, not just an after school or summer experience, um, you know, so the case of those kids, but could that be the everyday? So it was a really, really important aha moment for me. And and I, I think a running close second to that would be, um, on, you've heard us make reference to Red River, which was a project in in Texas. You know, we're underwater, we're in the current. Shelly and I are out, out exploring the paddle wheeled. And, you know, she tried really, really hard to convince me to just blindly let go. <laughs> and I, 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 that was a pivotal moment because not only did I tell her, no, heck no, I'm not letting go. I didn't let go of her either. So, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, helps it become, I think, just that much more of a journey. So uh, uh, absolutely. So thank you for that. Um, you know, a couple um, of the other questions um, that the staff, you know, want to know. One of my staff members said that, you know, 20 years is longer than most marriages today. Um, so what made it past um, last? And, and I think we've talked ab- on, about lots of things that contributed um, um, to that, but I wonder if or sort of when the the work that we were ultimately doing together, at some point it kind of became a roadmap or a template, if you will, right? For not just starting a business in this case, but but driving the direction of an organization. And so one of the questions that they wanted to know was, you know, looking back 20 years later, you know, would we do it differently? I'm gonna start with you, Dennis. Hmm, that's a very interesting question. Um, it is. Every once in a while the staff is uber profound. Yes, right. Not always. Here, <laughs> so I'm gonna be very existential about it, okay? Um, you know, it, that's one of the, those questions that's very difficult mm-hmm. because it, we're not, you, you know, it's not now that we're doing, this isn't like back to the future or something, you know? Um, so it's kind of like, I would say, would we have done things differently had we known things, you know, because I think we were all learning. Well, of course we probably would have. On the other hand, I think always you mentioned it. Some of, some of one of our greatest strengths was our collective ignorance 
that really you shouldn't be able to do this, you know? And that's how some great things happen all the time. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, you know, the, the, the logical answer is, of course, we would have done things differently, but we didn't because they were different times and there were different, different um, uh, both situations and pressures. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, we, we didn't mention that I head the MFA in science and natural history filmmaking. And one of the things we're dealing with now is, you know, the general crisis in science communication. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. PAST was really doing was laying the groundwork to solve. And it's a very complicated problem, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, PAST is laying, is, was and is laying the foundation to you know, solve part of that problem anyway, maybe not the entire problem, but a lot of that. And I think, you know, that's, that's one of its strengths. So whatever decisions we made or didn't make back in the past, this is where we are now, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, and, and I think we've all learned, and I think the past as an organization, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. including the current organization has learned. And so we go on to the future, um, better educated and, and more learned, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I I would absolutely agree with with that. Um, does anybody else want to add anything else on that, or we we can move on to either way? Well, I guess I'd say that I think one of the things we stumbled on, at least for me, which was extremely profound in my thinking, and I've noticed has been a huge obstacle for others, is it has been that we can, we. We didn't coin the term, certainly, but we grasped it and held on to it. And that's transdisciplinary, mm -hmm. that we saw everything holistically. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that allowed us to make decisions that probably other people scratched their heads at. Um, but it really, it changed, it, it never put us in a, um, in a box, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we didn't know what to call it when we first started out. We were doing it from the get-go. Um, but we just, at some point, we, 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 we discovered the term and we started to use it. Mm -hmm. And it really seems to me that it, it, it probably uh, defines past more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. that, 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 if I can just jump in, that's a great mm -hmm. point, because that's one of the things we talk about, how the sciences tend to get siloed. Mm -hmm. You know, things like how the pandemic is also an environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. you know, is, is multiple things. And past has always brought disciplines together. So that's a great point, Shelley. I think that's, that's really true. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and, and I think that that was one of the ways, and there were many ways um, where um, Andy, the skill that you brought, one of the things that you did a great job, you know, Dennis was out trying to gather that sort of um, that film story over and over again and, and to push us in really, really creative ways to figure out how would we be able to do that sort of in a mass media. But you helped us with the visual storytelling in a way that was really, I think, you know, and others correct me wrong, that was fairly unique at the time, right? Because you were literally taking the work, the science, whatever the, it happened to be, the history, you know, in the case of lots of these shipwrecks or whatnot, and literally pulling it apart, you know, fully understanding and the deconstructing of it and building it back in that sort of visual web space to tell a story that people could understand. You know, Shelley said, you know, earlier in reference to Red River, oh, well, you know, how many school bus, you know, could you park on the main deck of a, of a paddle wheel steamer? <laughs> And <clears throat> that's not a small, I mean, for, in my mind, I mean, I think that's one of those sort of examples back to what Dennis was, was trying to talk about is, you know, I think that oftentimes the way that you chose to reach in and grab pieces of whatever it was that we were doing it, because like, we're not always going to be the pieces that one, I think that when we sat down originally and said, hey, here's what this project's going to be, here's how we're going to tell the story, it never, ever went the way that you thought at the beginning and part of it was because of the pieces you chose to pull out on a story. Well, Shelly's shaking her head, right? You know, I'm right about this, yeah, right? Because I told, no, I, 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 agree. Yeah, I, I, I want you to talk about that just a little bit, Andy, because I think it's a piece that, I, you know, and love us, the organization that we are 20 years later, but I, you know, they, the, a lot of the, the folks that are on the piece of the journey right now, they don't understand how hard we had to work to learn why story matters so much. I think if someone 
today in 2021 goes back and looks at the things that past was doing in 2001 um, and and for the during the first five years mm -hmm. um, I think someone without that context especially maybe a younger person um, would look at that and say well that's that's interesting but it's not very novel well it was novel mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the time mm -hmm. um, and uh, to you to your earlier question about what would you do different mm -hmm. um, I can't answer that specifically in the broader sense, but I think it's really important to understand that what past was doing, what past innovative was doing innovatively, what past innovated, what past created, um, which presented a lot of challenges to convincing others um, of its value has now become very standard and very, very commonplace, interdisciplinary. Um, that was not, that was not where, that was not where education was. That was not where anthropology was 20 years ago. And so I think that uh, it, it, it's been very exciting to be part of that early on and to be groundbreakers in that sense. Yeah, I think, you know, Andy, you, you, you proved to the world that simple wasn't stupid. And I think that's huge. <laughs> I, 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 I I'm going to quote you on that. <laughs> <laughs> because I think you took very complex concepts and you made them mm -hmm. understandable mm -hmm. to just about anyone who got on our site. And to your mm -hmm. point, that wasn't being done. In fact, it was the, it was right. the reverse. You know, you people wanted to use more complex words and they wanted to mm -hmm. use really kind of very complex <clears throat> language to get these their things apart, thinking that was gonna help them be smarter. But you actually drove us in the, this, in the direction of let's make it simpler. Mm -hmm. And it didn't mean make it stupid or dumb, it just made make it easy to understand. And I think past 20 years into the future is the recipient of that gift. Mm -hmm. No, I totally, I totally agree. Andy's, you know, constantly explaining things, bringing in some of the historical stuff. I, I can still remember sort of the emails like, oh, what about, you know, that? So I think, I think in some respects, Andy and I were trying to do related things. Mm -hmm. You know, I was trying to make it so that it would be cinematic. He was trying to make it so it's accessible. You know, mm -hmm. both of us mm -hmm. are trying mm -hmm. to make it so people could fairly quickly understand what we were talking about and what we were doing you know, in we our were, respective we all, media, so. We were all doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. We were all doing that, bringing our own background and skills to do that. That was, that was an over, again, that was an overarching thing to make something very complex, very technical. Early on, it was archeology span or nautical archeology span and later it's expanded to other areas of mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. um, but to make something that was highly technical and highly specialized um, much more accessible and much more understandable. And I think that's something that that is something that passed that all of us have done very well with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and, that, and that was the key to past success mm -hmm. and longevity. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, 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 there's no question in my mind whatsoever, right? That it was very foundational. And, and Shelley's right. We, we are the recipient uh, of that work over time because it has helped us not only think about that notion of accessibility. And I really love that. I think that was the absolutely right, Shelley, way to sort of express that, that, you know, you go, that, that that's, and that, that piece is key to actually taking anything to scale, right? I mean, without that as part of our foundational component, and that happens all the time, you know, we, we push on stuff, you know, it doesn't have to be this complex. Here are the pieces, here are the parts. This is how you build a thing. This is how you think about team. And that's the other thing I think that we do really, really well, you know, circling back around, Shelly was talking about transdisciplinary. We live and breathe that. And we, yes, we didn't have the right label on it in the beginning, but, but we definitely learned to embrace that as a component that made it possible for us to imagine 
many, many things. And if you can imagine it, then, you know, theoretically we, we, we could act on it. I want to sort of wrap us all up a bit with what I thought was probably the most profound question that came from the staff, you know, as they think about what is it that you want to know. Um, and, and, and it's a, it's a question that's um, tied to the idea of, Here's the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to phrase the question exactly it was posted to me and then we'll circle back around on it a, a little bit. Um, you know, the question was, how did you know when it was time to, to leave your other jobs to focus on past full time? Now, we didn't all leave our other jobs, but we did collectively make a decision to past is going to be full time. And I think the essence of this question, because this is a young entrepreneurial, um, you know, um, components of, of past that are basically asking the question, when do you leap? And how do you know it's the right moment to leap? Uh, so I just got to sort of toss that sort of to the group as it relates to just sort of thinking about, you know, because it's a tough thing, right? And I don't know that there was one specific thing, you know, and, I, and I, my guess is we all sort of have a, you know, a different personal thread that sort of led to, hey, let's do this thing a little bit differently. Let's do it bigger. Let's walk away from something that we're already doing, you know, um, in the case of, of Shelly and I, who, who, who went full time. But, but as a group, we said the moment has come and we should, in fact, do this thing. This is Startup 101, Shelly. <laughs> wow. Yeah, cliff jumping, one of my mm -hmm. favorite things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I talk about it all the time with young people mm -hmm. you, to be to not that you'll land. You might splat or you might land on your feet, <laughs> but you will land. <laughs> I, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a time when we wanted to do something. And I think the more we talked about it, the more as to, to Andy and to Dennis's point, the more we became convinced we could, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that it wasn't going to be easy. There was never, ever, I think that's something that's extremely important to put across. I know maybe you guys think differently, but I never, ever thought it was going to be easy up until the moment I walked out the door. I just never thought that, but I never thought that no was going to stay no. <laughs> so, so taking those leaps and, uh, mm. I, you know, I, I know that uh, Annalise and I have both talked a number of people over the cliff on a number of occasions <laughs> and uh here let me help you <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here, look. look at Wait, me look over there <laughs> yeah. um and that they've you know gone off the cliff and when they've landed they've said oh we landed and we're like yeah it's okay um but i think that that is extremely important um in knowing that it's never going to be easy you know, and so when you're ready to go, your, your passion is going to have to carry you. It's going to have to float you through the night. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a, that was what the cliff jumping was. And, and I, I think, though, that if I had known about the weather in Columbus, <laughs> I thought that cliff jumping a little bit. You would have negotiated differently? <laughs> <laughs> I negotiated for Trader Joe's. I remember that was my I remember thing. that, yeah. I said, I am not moving there until you get a Trader Joe's. And, and we did, magically. And Chip wrote me, <laughs> the minute you got one, the minute the doors opened, he goes, Shelly, we have a Trader Joe's. <laughs> Pack your bags. <laughs> yeah, I was like, damn. I make that trip, didn't I? So, yeah. Uh, Dennis or Andy? Um, I mean, I think the mo you know, my, my position sort of changed a little, mm -hmm. you know, when I went to the board. Um, but, um, you know, there was, there was just a point where it was clear that past was, was going to make it. I mean, I remember when we decided to buy the building, you know, or, you know, rent the building and then buy the building, do, you know, I, I this crazy thing of, behind us. Yeah. <laughs> I sit on a couple of boards including one of my synagogue and buildings are always like the worst thing, you know, they're the best thing and the worst thing, because that's really a commitment. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have rent or you have a mortgage or you have something, but I remember when we did that and I really had no, you know, it was a risk obviously, but past had always been about risks. So I remember mm -hmm. it's like, 
sure yeah if we can make you know if it fits what we need to do and of course now it looks great you know i remember what it looked like when, before all the renovations and things and picking out the kitchen cabinets or whatever the hell we were doing back those days. <laughs> but um the um so i think there was a point and it was before the building but it was just mm -hmm. like you know this is we're gonna keep going you know and yeah you know and nothing is without challenges so you just take that as they come mm -hmm. but the past had especially you know in the first five years but even immediately after that it had known when to sort of shift emphases it knew when to expand what it was doing so um a lot of that is is you know tribute to you Annalise you mm -hmm. you need to take the credit for that <laughs> but um and we had support, you know, mm -hmm. it from what would used to be, you know, our original <clears throat> advisory board or whatever it was, was a bunch of academics. And now we had community members and nonprofit people and corporate people. Mm -hmm. And when we, you know, when, when you saw that, when I saw that, I said, okay, you know, we're, we're laying a very solid foundation here for the future of past. So I mm -hmm. think that's, that's, you know, when I realized it. So, do you think it comes from the fact that we have to put our lives in each other's hands when we're underwater? I've often wondered that. Mm -hmm. That you know, we get underwater. Annalise stood on me several times. True. Um, and you know, she'd never let go of that wheel, mm -hmm. and she would not mm -hmm. let go of that hub. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is we had to believe in each other. We had to put that faith mm -hmm. in each other's hands. Mm -hmm. in, on so many times it had nothing to do but when it so when it came to past and earlier you guys talked about what a team we made when it came to past we were already ready to put our we already trusted each other with our lives mm -hmm. therefore we can mm -hmm. trust each other with our passions it seemed mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. yeah I mean, I mean I don't it's remember beautiful. us ever <laughs> saying no to be quite honest you know, I mean, there were probably little no, things. No, she said you know? no. She would not let go of that. <laughs> no, 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 no. But you know what I'm saying. You know, it was like, yeah, it's not like no, we won't do that. But, you yeah. know, so I yeah. think that's, I think you're right, Shelly. I, I, you know, I'm not a diver, so I don't have the same point of reference. But I, I, I think it's very appropriate. So. <laughs> You put cameras down though, 4,000 feet, Dennis. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, you know, so. Same, it, same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. Oh, yeah. We, you know, hey, past, past pushed me to places I'd never been before. So. I yeah, promised yeah. a journey. I promised yeah. adventure. <laughs> yeah, I, I remind I, Shelly the whole time. There. Andy, no. <laughs> Andy. No, just to follow what, what, was what Dennis said, I don't remember anyone saying no. Um, I remember a lot of how on earth are we going to do that? Mm -hmm. um, but I also remember that everybody brought a really unique uh, individual perspective to a problem. And that gave past in the early years, a lot of sort of intellectual flexibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to address problems that, that might have, that, that, that might have sunk um a, a, a small, somewhat, um, somewhat tenuous organization mm -hmm. early on mm -hmm. um, that, that formed the basis of a stronger organization that could grow and adapt and, and, uh, and into the future. So mm -hmm. I would so agree that, with that. Yeah. From my perspective, that's been the great, that's been the great key to the success of past. Yeah. Well, um, I want to thank all of you, not just for, <clears throat> excuse me, taking time out of your day today to have the conversation, but more importantly for, um, you know, having enough faith in us, us together to take the, take the leap to begin with, right? You know, it wasn't just that we said, hey, let's jump off this cliff together <laughs> or, you know, build the airplane while we fly it or, you know, all of, all of those components that we hear all the time. I, I, for me, the, the single biggest moment was that we collectively said, you know, not just why not, but uh, very deliberately, yeah, let's do this thing and let's do this thing together. Um, and I think that, you know, that there's, Shelly's Shelley, right. You know, I, I think the mindset from the outside was, you know, I, I have enough faith and trust um, in these collective people with, with my work world, whatever that happens to be to, um, to delve into a passion. And, you know, had we not done that, 
together. And I think had it been any, you know, a different four people, it would never have ended up the same sort of way. And, you know, who knows what it'll do, you know, as it grows into the future. But um, I, for one, am just so grateful um, for, for all of you. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.